12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. It has taken two years, but testimony now underway in the trial of a man accused of killing his girlfriend. Investigators say the body of Cora Nickel was found by her young daughters after she was killed by Jorge Izquierdo, their father. Those two little girls first to take the stand, telling jurors what they saw before their mother's death. Erica Hernandez there for that and for what they say they discovered after. I told her I think mom is dead. Now 10 and 7 years old, two little girls bravely took the stand today in the trial of Jorge Izquierdo. He's accused of fatally shooting 27-year-old Cora Nickel back in August 2020. Both the girls say that after a birthday party, they went home and their parents began arguing. At one point once home, they say their mom, Cora, asked Jorge to leave. She told her, told him to leave. They fell asleep shortly after, but woke up to a nightmare. The oldest, the first to find their mother in a pool of blood. I went downstairs and I seen her laying there with liquid around. I didn't know what it was because it was dark. I just immediately ran back upstairs because I was like scared. I thought it was like a nightmare. Jorge Izquierdo was nowhere to be found, and it was revealed he had fled the state to a relative's house in California where he was later arrested. The girls were able to call their grandmother who rushed over and called 911. As for the defense, they believe this is all just circumstantial evidence and that nobody actually saw what happened to Cora Nichols the night she was killed. As for Jorge Izquierdo, if he is found guilty, he is facing five to 99 years or life in prison. At the Kennedy Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. We now know the names of the victims in a double shooting on the city's south side. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, 15-year-old Angel Garcia and 19-year-old Gregoria Cordova Mejia were killed in that shooting. It happened back uh, last Friday at the Union Pines Apartments in the 1700 block of Pleasanton Road. They were both found dead inside a stairwell there. No arrests have been made. An 18-year-old is facing robbery and assault charges in connection with a meetup planned on Instagram. Valen Cortez is accused of being one of three people who attacked a woman inside of a car back on June 22nd. San Antonio police say the victim agreed to meet up with another suspect named Josiah Rodriguez through Instagram. When the victim entered the vehicle, she told police Cortez and another woman allegedly started attacking her, eventually taking her purse. The victim was able to escape even after being threatened with a gun, allegedly by Rodriguez. Police say the suspects later found the victim's address and allegedly stole a car. Cortez and Rodriguez were found six days later after being involved in a crash with a reported stolen vehicle. Police are still looking for Rodriguez, who ran from the scene. We're learning more about the suspect and the deadly shooting at a gym on the north side of the city last night. This is not the first time that 32 year old Jesse McWilliams has been in trouble with the law. This time, police say he walked up to another man inside the LA Fitness near Loop 410 in Blanco and shot that man in the head. That news, as Katrina Weber found out today, came as a surprise to a lot of people. A single gunshot around seven last night cleared the entire building at LA Fitness. San Antonio police found out that shot also left a 34-year-old man dead. Witnesses told them he was working out at this gym near Loop 410 in Blanco when another man walked up and shot him in the head. Despite the commotion, the news still escaped some people who showed up expecting a normal start to their day. I interrupted a little bit. I came to work out and unfortunately the gym's closed. Got up nice and early today to get into the gym, but uh, yeah, I was surprised to find that it was closed. They found no notice on the door and only found out from us what had happened. While the news came as a surprise to some people today, what they find even more shocking is that this isn't the first time it's happened. The last shooting here was almost exactly a year ago. That trouble in July of last year, according to police, started inside but caught up with two men outside. Both were shot, one killed by a gunman who got away. In this latest case, police caught the suspect, 32-year-old Jesse McWilliams, still in the area. They say they also found the gun nearby. Records show McWilliams has a long criminal history, nearly a dozen prior arrests for crimes including drugs and weapons. The shooting last night has others rethinking their future. I may uh, start working out at home. So <laughs> I, I need a reliable workout schedule. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News.
Uvalde City representatives and community members taking the first steps today to plan a permanent memorial for the Robb Elementary School victims. The city holding a strategic planning meeting to go over some of the initial ideas on how to properly honor those victims. One of the ideas presented was to place 21 plaques around a fountain at the plaza. The uncle of Jackie Casares said the families he's spoken to have also said they would like to keep a permanent memorial at the Robb Elementary site after it's torn down. It's something you have to take your time with. Right now we're in the grieving process. It, it is in the stage where we're asking for accountability, different things of that nature. But it's something that has to be well, really well thought out and it, get the immediate family members involved. Again, this just the first of many scheduled meetings. There are no official plans for the memorial or funding. City officials say the final decision will be made by the families. Just about a half hour ago, the San Antonio City Council passed a resolution supporting abortion access. The council voted 9-2 to two after an emotionally charged meeting about one of the country's most hot-button topics. Our Garrett Berger joins us live from City Council Chambers with more on that. Garrett. But with the overturning of Roe v. Wade recently, many people are worried about their ability to access an abort safely access abortions considering both new and old state laws and unsurprisingly this issue this issue drew a crowd to city council chambers more than 80 people spoke before council members even began their discussion this afternoon and while the resolution they passed shows where the council stands the city ultimately does not have much direct power on this issue the resolution does not legalize or even decriminalize abortion here in San Antonio, but it would recommend a policy to not use city money to collect information on abortions for the purpose of criminal investigations. It also says the city intends to fight for abortion access in the next state legislative session. And while there are significant things outside the control of the authority of the city, we must do everything in our power to protect all those seeking abortion and other reproductive health care from unnecessary harassment. However, District 8 Councilman Manny Pelias, one of the two votes against the resolution, said while he supports abortion rights, he cast doubt on what the resolution actually accomplishes. The city attorney confirmed the resolution does not decriminalize abortion in San Antonio and that city council cannot direct the city manager to prioritize certain, cr certain crimes over others. And if someone reports a crime, SAPD will investigate it depending on its priority list. However, Councilwoman Terry Castillo, the District 5 Councilwoman who you just heard and was the driving force behind this resolution, holds that the measure still hold, means something and holds weight, though she said it is a first step. Live in Council Chambers, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. The monkeypox vaccine is now here in Bear County, enough to vaccinate 500 people. Metro Health says it has received 1,000 doses of the Geneos vaccine. For now, those shots will be reserved to protect those most at risk, along with close contacts during contact tracing investigations. Health officials say vaccine distribution will expand as more doses are received. The United States so far has about 5,000 reported cases here in Bear County. We've been holding steady at 13 since last week. Now to help small and micro businesses impacted by the pandemic, the city of San Antonio for the third year in a row is offering COVID impact grants of up to $35,000. This year, it totals $17 million in federal COVID relief funds. For business owners like Andrea Lay, who've been awarded grants in the past, since they're not loans, they haven't had to worry about paying the money back. Instead, they've been able to invest that money in what they need to sustain and grow their businesses. The deadline to apply is August 22nd. The longtime small business advocate and nonprofit lender Lift Fund is overseeing this year's program for the city. So our priority right now are small businesses in the city of San Antonio who have not had access to grant programs in the past. To register for tomorrow's 2 p.m. informational webinar, just go to cityofsanantoniocovidgrants.com. That same website has information about who is eligible to apply and how you can get help with that application process. We also have all that information and more on our website at ksat.com. Let's take a look at traffic here. This is the TransGuide camera I-35 in Evans Road. You can see things look like they're moving pretty smoothly in both directions. We have seen some stop and go traffic there on the outside lane, but of course that is just the typical six o'clock commute, especially on I-35. 
New at six sky high housing costs are affecting all of us, but they are hitting people experiencing homelessness, especially hard. Many people are working to secure housing, but even with jobs, they still can't afford rising rent prices. As Courtney Friedman reports, local organizations are struggling to help. I actually lived on the streets, um, under bridges, uh, trying to sleep in parks because the grass is softer than concrete. Sam Ministries helped Anthony Wolf move into this hotel, converted into a shelter. Wolf has a job and a plan, but hasn't been able to find an affordable apartment since September. I've tried, they've tried um, to get me out of this program and out on my own, and it hasn't really worked yet, um, all because of housing prices. We were able to house um, over 1,500 people last year because of all the resources we had through the CARES Act and the COVID response, but now a lot of those resources are starting to wind down. The Katie Vela is the executive director of the South Alamo Regional Alliance for the Homeless, or SARA. We maintain a resource eligibility list of people that are interested in housing, experiencing homelessness that need a resource. Right now that list is over 2,000 people. She gave us a sneak peek at Town Twin Village, a community being built to house adults over 50 moving out of homelessness. Phase one of the project includes building these 13 tiny homes. As you can see, they're all in a circle facing each other to bring a sense of community. Well, at the end of both phases, it'll be around 200 people that live here. And then they're also hoping to provide services to the surrounding community. While prices stay high, Wolf is keeping the faith for more projects and resources like this. I have to. That's all I have. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. We are keeping our eye on two big grass fires working in the hill country this evening, along with several small grass fires around the area. This one you're seeing here called Smoke Rider up in Blanco County. County officials there are calling this a vegetation fire on social media. Crews from Blanco and Hayes counties are trying to get this one under control. Air units also on the scene helping out. It's happening along FM 165 near Los Colinas Drive. That fire now about 250 acres. Voluntary evacuations are being called for. Meanwhile, a shelter has been opened up at the Blanco Methodist Church. Some intense flames there, but certainly not the only ones out there right now. Crews also battling another large grass fire, this one north of Fredericksburg. The Kerrville Daily Times calling this the Big Sky Fire. They say it had zero containment at last check. Now, according to the Gillespie County Communications 911 Emergency Dispatch Facebook page, there are several units fighting this fire. Smoke reportedly can be seen from Lano and Mason counties. No word yet on how many acres are burning here or if any structures might be in danger. Yeah. And Tim and Myra, those fires that you were just talking about are big enough to see on satellite uh, imagery from space. And I'm sure if you live up uh, near uh, Spring Branch, uh, you could look north and see that Blanco fire. Here's a look at the satellite imagery right now. And again, you can see these very clearly. That one up in northern Gillespie County, smoke plume blowing north. And that one there in eastern Blanco County, right on the Hayes County line, the smoke blowing north there as well. Here's what we're going to talk about in the forecast near record heat heat tomorrow. It goes without saying, but tomorrow fire danger is going to be high. Gusty winds plus dry vegetation equal a pretty high fire risk tomorrow. And by the week's end, though, there will be some isolated rain and we'll be shaving off a few degrees. Talking about this and more coming up in the forecast. We've empowered people to take action when something bad happens. Isn't the idea that we want to prevent something bad from happening? The debate over red flag laws intensifies after a mass shooting. There are often arguments over striking a balance between government overreach and keeping weapons out of the hands of someone intent on violence. Texas doesn't have a red flag law, so what can be done in the Lone Star State to take weapons from someone who was believed to be a threat? We found out there are ways to do it, but it doesn't mean those guns will be out of their possession for long. It's a brand new case that explains coming up in our next half hour. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. Back-to-back -back break ins at a Bear County business in just a matter of days. One suspect is in custody, another on the run. Why police think this is part of a growing trend. 
Also, extreme heat with little to no rain. Yes, it's bad for most things, especially for your water pipes. The potential problems to look for on your property. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. All right, thanks, Stephanie. A drought obviously causing a lot of problems. We were hoping to show you a view from Sky 12 here. One of those grass fires, there it is. This is the Big Sky Fire. This is the one we told you about north of Fredericksburg. A ton of smoke in this area right now. Yeah, this is uh, one of the big ones that's out there. Sarah, no surprise to see this stuff today. It's so dry out there. Doesn't take much to get one of these started. And then there's also wind, which is only going to get worse tomorrow. Yeah, that's that's the big story. The heat, the wind, and the fact that it has been so dry, that's the reason grass fire danger is high tomorrow. We're also going to have a little bit more humidity in the air tomorrow, so that's good when it comes to fire danger, but it is going to make it feel a lot hotter than what thermometer reads during the day tomorrow. All right, outside right now, it's still 100 degrees at the airport. We've got 102 in Del Rio. 102 in New Braunfels, 103 in Pleasanton, 106 in Catula right now. Let's zoom in a little bit closer to the metro area. Just some puffy cumulus clouds around San Antonio. And again, other than in the hill country, temperatures are still in the triple digits. We just showed you that Sky 12 was flying over one of these grass fires up here. Once again, you can see the smoke plumes from space. That's how large these fires are. And I'm sure if you're anywhere in, uh, let's say, uh, Kendall, County, Kirk County, and even in parts of Comal County, you look to the north, you can probably see uh, the smoke from these fires. Now, the smoke itself is blowing north of the metro area, should not impact San Antonio, but high fire danger will be out there tomorrow. Uh, so here's some things to keep in mind for your fire safety tips for your Wednesday. No campfires or burn piles. Avoid using any kind of tools that create sparks, including chainsaws. Dispose of cigarettes properly do not drag trailer chains and also do not park vehicles on grass because a hot vehicle can spark a fire quickly. We got up to 102 today. That makes 53 100 degree days so far this year. We are awfully close to the first and second place of the most 100 degree days on record in San Antonio during a year. We may even surpass second place in just the next couple of days here because this is a look at how hot it's going to be tomorrow. 103 for the high and Thursday. That's going to tie a record at least. We may even come to breaking those records if we can get a degree or two hotter. But notice that by Friday and Saturday, those highs should stay just below 100. It's still going to be hot. The reason for that, there is the potential for some isolated showers and storms. Now, right now, a low pressure system uh, near Louisiana and the Mississippi coastline pre uh, creating quite a bit of rainfall there, but we're not going to see that much rain here in San Antonio, and here's the reason why. That heat high is still going to be the dominant weather factor, suppressing showers and storms from growing in the vertical all that much, but still the energy from that low could fire off one or two isolated showers or storms Friday and Saturday and keep the temperature under 100. Uh, that's the best we can do as far as rain chances go, unfortunately. For your KSAT 12 hour forecast, waking up at 79 degrees, it's going to be humid tomorrow morning and quickly we're going to warm up with clearing skies. 93 around lunch and 103 for the high temperature in San Antonio. Elsewhere, it'll be even hotter, especially out west, 105 Del Rio. 105 Uvalde, even 100 degrees in the hill country where temperatures have been below 100 the last couple of days. 104 in Hondo, 105 in Pleasanton, 103 in Seguin, and 104 in New Braunfels. It's going to stay pretty humid in the afternoon tomorrow, so that means a heat index value of 106 to 108. And again, please do your part to try to avoid any kind of grass fires. Saharan dust will be light and in the air through Thursday through Saturday. Tim, Myra. All right, it keeps going. Thank you, Sarah. And Cowboys camp keeps going. Greg Simmons <laughs> live for us tonight out on Oxnard, California, with the latest on what's happening with the Cowboys. Yeah, we got the story tonight at the cornerback, Anthony Brown, who's changing his number, but he's not changing his attitude. When we come back, his story here in camp. Also, we come back, the Roadrunners kick off their fall camp coming up. Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our live coverage of the Dallas Cowboys training camp here in Oxnard, California. Day two in full pads for the first time in the Cowboys training camp. Now, one of the players has caught the eye of both wide receiver CeeDee Lamb and head coach Mike McCarthy has been that of 
receiver Dennis Houston, an undrafted free agent out of Western Illinois who graduated from Warren High School in San Antonio. It's a day at a time mentality, you know what I'm saying? You can't be too high, can't be too low. A bunch of days out here and just make plays when you can. His releases are A1. Um, and then, I mean, it's just for him to have that such twitchiness already and uh, just off of his ability, I mean, you can only add to that. And we wish him the best. Now, for a guy entering the final year of his contract, Anthony Brown has a lot of confidence coming into training camp, even though he suffered through some criticism last season. But he's actually coming off his best season of wearing the stars. 71 tackles, three interceptions, and one touchdown. You know, this is my last year on my deal, um, year seven. You know, it's, it's nothing but up from here. I feel like I'm just getting better, and I feel like my best year is ahead of me. His three-year, $15.5 million contract extension Brown signed in 2019 ends in 2022. And to help motivate him in the final year of his contract, he has changed his number from 30 to 3. I just wanted to reinvent myself with a new look, and um, I just feel good about myself. You know, I gave 30 to – I didn't choose 30. 30 was given to me, so I wanted to choose something for myself. So I just took the zero off and kept the three. Brown is already showing off his reinvented self with an interception right out of the gate against quarterback Dak Prescott. Now, what about going up against two other great quarterbacks in the first two games of the season in Tom Brady and Joe Burrow? I love it, man. I mean, why, who wouldn't want to go against the greats? I mean, if you want to win a Super Bowl, you got to face them anyway, so let's get it on. Brown has had his fair share of criticism, especially following games against the Buccaneers and the Raiders, where he got burned for touchdowns and penalties. But his head coach has his back. I think he's someone that that uh, should get more love from you guys, just a suggestion. But I think, I think he's done... He's done a lot of good things, but more importantly, he's he's been he's very very consistent. Yeah, I appreciate that. M much love to Mike for even saying that, man. That felt good for him to say that. In six seasons with the Cowboys, Brown has produced 282 combined tackles, 52 pass deflections, nine interceptions, and 82 career games, including playing in 16 last year. Can he tell he's elevated his game? I'll just say confidence and um, just mentally stronger, you know, movement, and um, the game slowing down, you know, understanding rock concepts and the offensive scheme. You know what? And Brown tells us without that confidence, you'll be second, year, second guessing yourself all season long. UTSA Roadrunners kicked off their fall training camp this week with a shot of winning back-to-back -back conference USA titles after taking their first last season in a school record 12-2 finish. Today, head coach Jeff Trailer was asked if there are any transfers that could be day one contributors. I haven't seen them in pads with me coaching them yet. It's, it's been in pajamas, and there's a lot of guys that look really good in pajamas, uh, and there's a lot of guys that don't look good in pajamas. Uh, and then when the pads come on, all of a sudden, that 4'9 guy that didn't broad jump very well is out there making plays like crazy. <laughs> I love the pajama reference. All right. Remember, the UTSA Roners kick off their regular season of September the 3rd. That's one week after the KSAT Pigskin Classic 2022 inside the Alamo Dome, presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers. They will take on Houston also in the Alamo Dome. Live from California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. Still to come here at 6 o'clock, a brand new case that explains. We're talking about what can be done to remove a gun from someone in Texas and how that's different from a red flag law. Up next. It seems to happen after every mass shooting. The shooter's past or behavior identified as a missed red flag dots that should have been connected to signal trouble. But when it comes to red flag laws, only 19 states have them. Texas does not. And some Texas lawmakers who oppose red flag laws have argued that we already have laws that can force someone to give up their guns. In this case, that explains we find out what it takes to remove a gun from someone in Texas and just how easy it can be to get it back. We also head to Florida, a state with a red flag law, to explain how it works. He made threats of violence and rape, shared a video online depicting a dead animal in a plastic bag, even had the nickname school shooter. Those details about the gunman are findings in a report by the Texas House Committee investigating the massacre at Robb Elementary. 
all details that surfaced after 19 children and two teachers were murdered. What the shooter did not have was a criminal history or diagnosed mental illness. There's all this conversation about we should have connected the dots. Does Texas have a mechanism that you know of that connects those dots? We have a system where we report individuals to the DPS if they've been committed, um, for example, or if they have a guardian. And that theoretically prevents them from purchasing weapons. But unless you've hit the very tail end of, uh, of that crisis system, unless you're at the end of that whole process, you're under the radar. And Texas has no mechanism to check for it. Judge Oscar Kazin presides over probate court one in Bear County. In addition to wills and estates after someone's death, he also deals with guardianship and emergency apprehension and detention. Both are ways in which someone can be forced to give up weapons under certain circumstances. For someone to be granted guardianship over another person, there must be evidence that person is incapacitated. You can't provide for yourself. You can't take care of yourself. You're so permanently uh, disabled that uh, and incapacitated that you can't provide for your safety, then a person can come in as their guardian. Emergency apprehension and detention is used in cases where someone has become a threat to themselves or others. If somebody is making threatening statements, posts online, is that enough for an emergency apprehension and detention? Yes, if the threat is eminent, apparent, and it's related to mental illness, if no law has been broken, but they are a danger to themselves or they're making threats to someone, then an officer can detain them and rather than take them to jail, take them to an emergency room for observation. And at that time, if the person has guns or other weapons on them, law enforcement can confiscate those. But if you are not ultimately committed, law enforcement officers are required to give the weapon back. And that's done without benefit of a hearing. Very few individuals who are detained in Bear County ultimately get committed. Committed to receive mental health treatment. According to the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, over 12,000 people in San Antonio and Bear County were placed under emergency apprehension and detention from July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2022. Of those detentions, there were 479 reports of weapons seized. STRAC does not keep track of how many detentions result in commitments. Every day, law enforcement officers come marching into this court and shake their heads and hand me a document where I sign off that the person has not been committed and they have to give them back their weapon. And those law enforcement officers are shaking their heads, why? They just took the gun away from an eminently dangerous individual and they're giving it back without any mechanism to see if it's even the right thing to do. We've empowered people to take action when something bad happens. Isn't the idea that we want to prevent something bad from happening? Bob Gualteri is the sheriff of Pinellas County, Florida, just outside of Tampa. Florida enacted a red flag law in March 2018, just weeks after a shooter gunned down 17 people at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. Since then, the risk protection orders afforded by that law have been used nearly 9,000 times in the state, 1,200 times in Pinellas County, the second highest number by county in Florida. Somebody can do something and it doesn't have to rise to the level of being a crime and it doesn't have to rise to the level of being actionable under the mental health statute. In fact, it may not even be mental health related. Somebody just may be a mean, angry person that wants to exact revenge on somebody else, and it may not rise the level of crime. If someone in Florida says or does something thought to be a red flag, a report must be made to law enforcement. They investigate and decide whether something needs to be done. Even if it's not actionable uh, from a uh, involuntary mental health standpoint or from a crime standpoint, is there something we should do because this, this person isn't right? Something is wrong here. Gualteri says the case is then reviewed by a supervisor or agency attorneys before proceeding to a judge. We need to make sure, especially with Second Amendment rights and the right to keep and bear arms and right to protect yourself, that it is properly vetted. So we have all these steps in place. Law enforcement officer investigates, has to articulate it, supervisory review, agency counsel review, then it goes to a judge. And if a judge determines 
that there's legal sufficiency, then the judge can issue a temporary order. That temporary order is done ex parte, meaning the person is not present, similar to getting a warrant. The order is good for 14 days, and within those 14 days, a trial is scheduled. That's when the person in question can be represented by an attorney to contest the order. Then a judge makes a ruling. The judge could deny the order or decide that person cannot possess or purchase guns or ammunition for a year. If circumstances change within that year, they can go back to the court and ask the court to reconsider. Once the order expires, Gualteri says there is nothing on a person's record to reflect it. But during the time the order is in place, that person should not pass a background check to buy a gun. And if they already possess weapons, they have to give them up but not necessarily to law enforcement. They can give it to a next door neighbor, they can give it to a family member, they can give it to a friend, or if they want, they can surrender it to law enforcement. So this isn't where cops are knocking on doors and taking people's guns. The sheriff admits this law is not perfect. Someone could turn right around and return the guns to a person who's not supposed to have them, or they could buy guns illegally. He says it's about creating speed bumps along a path to violence. And while red flag laws are often talked about after mass shootings, in Pinellas County, it's more commonly used in cases of domestic violence or when someone is threatening to hurt themselves. But everybody talks about prevention. People talk about getting information. People talk about connecting the dots. Well, if you get us all, all this information, and even if you do connect the dots, but you're not doing anything about it, then you haven't accomplished anything. And, and, and you're leaving it open until the next time something bad happened. Federal gun legislation signed into law after the Uvalde shooting provides states $750 million to create and manage red flag laws. Top Texas lawmakers have not signaled any interest. It's a tough challenge. How do, how do you ever get to live in a free society where we also get to check all those things when you haven't done anything wrong yet? I don't have the answer, but I'm really tired of watching people who I know were just recently seriously dangerous to themselves getting their gun back without any type of safety net. If you believe that someone you know needs an emergency apprehension or detention, you can call police to request one. Ask for a mental health officer to respond. Or you can also contact a court directly to ask for a judge's warrant. We have information on how to do that on our website, ksat.com. This QR code will take you there, and it will also take you to the KSAT Explains page where you can watch any of the KSAT Explains segments we've done so far. We'll be right back. All right, we want to check in again on those big grass fires happening up in Hill Country. This is Sky 12 uh, looking over the Big Sky Fire. This is north of Fredericksburg in Gillespie County. Right now we know that it is about 200 acres in size right now. 0% containment. Yeah, a ton of smoke out there at the moment. We know several different agencies fighting this fire. Uh, again, in Gillespie County, and this is just one of several that we have been keeping track of uh, here this afternoon that are actively burning. And Sarah Spivey here in the Weather Center for us, you're obviously keeping track of these numbers as well in terms of the updates on the fire, but it is just so dry out there right now. Very dry and also winds are gusting from the southeast at about 25, 30 miles per hour. That's why we're seeing, uh, you know, what, what some may call a tinderbox situation around south central Texas because there's plenty of dry vegetation, it's hot, and on top of that, it's windy as well. Now that smoke from those fires is burning away from the San Antonio metro area. It has been a hot one for us. We got up to 102 for the high temperature. Those fires so big that they can be seen from space. Here's a picture right now where you can see both the big sky fire in northern Gillespie County and that one on the Blanco Hayes County smoke rider fire 600 acres now at only 10% containment up from 200 acres earlier. Again, 102 was the high temperature one degree shy of a record set back in 2011 record challenging heat in the coming days and of course grass fire danger. All those details for you coming up in the forecast. All right, let's talk about those temperatures, those dry conditions. Sarah, you mentioned it. The wind is something that's certainly causing a problem for firefighters, breaking up the heat a little bit as well. Yeah, you know, the winds, although they're not 
intensely strong. They're strong enough to not make it an easy job for the firefighters out there. Winds will be gusting tomorrow too, up to about 30 miles per hour. The thing that's really causing the fire danger is how dry vegetation is because we just have not seen any significant rain. Last month alone, we only saw one one hundredth of an inch of rainfall. Here's another look at that satellite view from space of the two fires ongoing across the hill country. The bigger ones, uh, you can see that smoke plume from that fire up in northern Gillespie County. The big sky fire, as it's being called, zero percent containment smoke is blowing north because of the south winds. And then in Blanco County there to the northeast of Blanco, the smoke rider fire new update 600 acres now burned with only 10 percent containment again the smoke from these fires will continue to move north away from the san antonio metro area but they're probably visible up in the hill country for sure uh, throughout the day tomorrow again if those fires are still burning uh, the smoke will blow to the north because of a south wind so we won't have to worry about the smoke around san antonio from those fires however if a fire develops to the south of san San Antonio, we would be getting some smoke plumes and it's entirely possible that we could have some grass fires tomorrow because grass fire danger is very high around South Central Texas. You'll notice in this orange color, this deeper orange color, uh, the more rural areas, the higher the grass fire danger because there's more fuel for those fires in the form of that dry vegetation. But even with that being said, around the San Antonio area, grass fire danger is still high. This is uh, from the Texas A&M Forest Service, their forecast for fire danger tomorrow. Again, please use caution. Winds are going to be gusting from the south up to about 30 miles per hour tonight. And then tomorrow or in the morning hours, it shouldn't be too windy. But in the afternoon, that's when winds are going to start to pick up toward the sunset. Uh, that's when winds gusts will be up to about 30 miles per hour tomorrow. And it's going to be just plain old hot. We're forecasting high temperature of 103 in San Antonio, six degrees above the average, and also that would tie a record for the day. Elsewhere, it'll be 104 in New Braunfels, 105 in Pleasanton, 104 in Hondo, 105 in Uvalde. In the Hill Country, too, temperatures should top off near 100 degrees. Hot all around. So some fire tips for you. No campfires or burn piles. Avoid using any kind of tools that create sparks. If you do smoke, make sure to dispose of cigarettes properly don't drag trailer chains and finally do not park a vehicle on grass because that could easily catch fire. 100 degrees still outside with winds from the southeast. Again, it's gusty gusts up to 25 miles per hour. Tonight temperatures will be falling into the 80s. Tomorrow morning will be waking up at 79 degrees humid in the morning hours and temperatures will be climbing quickly under mostly sunny skies. 93 at noon, 103 for the high temperature. On top of that, it is going to be a bit humid tomorrow heat index values anywhere from 106 to 108 around San Antonio. Take care of yourself. This is real deal heat both tomorrow and Thursday. Light Saharan dust Thursday through Saturday with only a small chance for rain Friday and Saturday. All right. Thank you, Sarah. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. It is Tuesday, August 2nd. San Antonio City Council still discussing a resolution showing support for abortion access. Nearly three hours of public comments have taken up most of this emotionally charged meeting so far. At one point, Mayor Ron Nuremberg called a five minute recess. The issue provided some passionate comments from more than 80 speakers from both sides. It was so obviously the right decision for me and therefore two of the easiest decisions I've ever made. A woman does not abort her own body, she aborts someone else's body. What of the bodily autonomy of the preborn child? We're learning more about a murder outside of a Northside LA Fitness yesterday. The man charged with murder is 32-year-old Jesse McWilliams. Witnesses told police that they saw McWilliams walk up to the victim who had been working out inside the gym and shot him in the head. Police still have not released a motive for the shooting. The victim's name has not been released. Several fire departments are trying to get two grass fires under control. This one up in Blanco County, at least 250 acres there burning on 
FM 165 near Las Colonas Drive. And turning now to a second fire, this one burning west of Fredericksburg. This video also taken by Sky 12 within the last hour. You can see how that large plume of smoke is uh, continuing to grow there. Applebee's teeping up with a couple, I was worried about saying Winky Lux to create lip gloss that are based on their wing sauces. They include Be My Honey Pepper and Honey Barbecue Tea. The saucy glosses are only available on their website. Well, the big weather story tonight continues to be these fires across uh, the northern part of the hill country near Gillespie County and in Blanco in Hayes County. The fires are, are struggling to be contained at the moment. Only 10% containment on that smoke rider fire and 0% containment north of Fredericksburg. We'll continue to keep you updated on that. Just know that the big weather story is going to be the fire danger tomorrow. Record challenging heat forecasting 103 both Wednesday and Thursday. Lights air and dust in the air Thursday through Saturday. We really only have a small chance 20% for an isolated shower storm on Friday and Saturday. A little bit more cloud cover could keep our temperatures below 100. Otherwise, August is living up to its reputation as being our typically hottest month in San Antonio, and it'll continue to do so into next week as well. All right, and we'll keep you updated on those fires as they progress, and hopefully firefighters make some progress. Thanks so much for watching the News at 6. See you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Have a good evening.